Okay, the next item of business is a statement by Mary McAllen on the Edinburgh Tram Inquiry Report. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions on the issues raised in her report at the end of her statement. Uh, therefore, there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary uh, for around 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I am grateful to have the opportunity to make a statement in response to the Edinburgh Tram Inquiry Report. A comprehensive document totalling nearly a thousand pages uh, which I received on the morning of publication on the 19th September. The report was also laid in Parliament in line with the requirements of the Inquiries Act 2005. I believe that the report addresses the terms of reference that were set, namely to establish why the Edinburgh Tram project incurred delays, cost more than originally budgeted for and through reductions in scope delivered significantly less than projected. I recognise the extensive work and efforts of the inquiry team uh, in delivering this report and I'd like to thank all of those who contributed to the inquiry, including the many witnesses who provided evidence. I'm aware that the construction of the original tram line caused a great deal of disruption to the residents and businesses of Edinburgh. And I believe it's important that we recognise that frustration and ensure that lessons are learned and applied to future infrastructure projects be those local authority or central government. As such, I can confirm that this government has given very careful consideration to the full report, along with considering its recommendations, any actions required and lessons learned. I would like to be very clear that the primary objectives of this government in establishing the inquiry and throughout the process have been to support delivery of valid findings and recommendations, and to engage meaningfully and cooperate fully and openly in the production of evidence at the inquiry's request. Significant resources were committed to diligently carrying out this endeavour, and all of those who gave evidence on behalf of the Scottish Government did so in good faith, providing the inquiry with a comprehensive and accurate view of Scottish Minister's collective position throughout. Now, while I welcome the, the formal uh, publication of the report, I understand and I empathise with the public's frustration at the length of time that it took to conclude, as well as the cost to the public purse. This is, of course, particularly disappointing, uh, as it was this government's concern for the prudent public uh, spending that saw the commission uh, of the inquiry in 2014. However, as an independent statutory inquiry, it would have been very much beyond the powers of government to seek to influence the proceedings, and any questions on the length of time and of the cost of the inquiry are rightly for Lord Hardy to answer. The report itself contains 24 recommendations. A minority of these are directed to the government, and these mainly concern administrative processes and record management, including minute-taking and legislative and practical aspects of setting up inquiries. All recommendations, as I've said, are being considered in detail. The report also outlines 10 headline causes of failure, which contributed to the delays and cost overruns associated with the project. Nine of these relate directly to the actions of the City of Edinburgh Council and its arm's length delivery body tie, with the 10th and final cause only relating to Scottish ministers. Indeed, the Chair, Lord Hardy, is unambiguous, noting in a video statement that he produced alongside the report that, and I quote, ties failures were the principal cause of the failure to deliver the project on time and within budget. And he adds that the City of Edinburgh Council must, and I quote, also share principal responsibility with Ty for the delays in the design. This reflects the fact that responsibility for delivery of the project, including procurement and risk of any cost overruns, was solely and rightly for the City of Edinburgh Council. Now, the only cause of failure attributed to the actions of ministers was the decision following the debate in Parliament on June 2007 to reposition Transport Scotland as a principal funder, as opposed to a project partner. Now, setting aside for a moment the fact that this government was uh, very clear at the time about the risks inherent with the project, and actually that it was others represented in this Parliament today who voted the project through, it's clear that the outcome of that vote transferred accountability to the City of Edinburgh Council and necessarily altered Transport Scotland's relationship with the project going forward. Indeed, the failure to, any failure to clarify the role of Transport Scotland would have been an abdication of leadership and would have led to poor governance and confusion around roles. 
The decision to alter the governance arrangements was taken explicitly to avoid uncertainty about where leadership of the project lay, clarifying the government's roles as principal funders and on that basis preventing further calls on the public purse. It was exactly because of that clarity and the clear setting of governance boundaries that government funding for this project remained capped at the agreed 500 million and not a penny more. Following the parliamentary vote on the tram project, the decision to separate the roles of Transport Scotland as principal funder and City of Edinburgh Council as a project lead was in fact good governance and it helped to avoid potential delay and increased risk. Presiding officer, the report, as I've mentioned, identifies 24 recommendations, all of which I uh, will address. There are 11 that are directed expressly at Scottish ministers. Of these, four refer to the establishment and delivery of public inquiries, rather than to the Edinburgh Tram project itself. Two are jointly for Scottish ministers in COSLA to consider a range of measures to ensure robust project delivery. One concerns record keeping, and four relate to the provision of evidence and potential sanctions for providing any misleading evidence. Now, we're working through all of these recommendations, but I can report that additional guidance, similar to that which is suggested, is already in development with reference to the efficient establishment and delivery of public inquiries and has been shared with recent inquiries as they have been established. This government is very aware of the impact of public inquiries and the importance of effectively supporting them, ensuring efficient and timely reporting. Robust and enhanced procedures regarding minute-taking and documentation management, as suggested, these have already been embedded within the government and the civil service for a long time. The Permanent Secretary recently appeared at the Finance and Public Administration Committee and reiterated this commitment to ensuring robust systems and processes are in place to record and manage this critical information. Presiding officer, let me now turn to recommendations that involve collaboration with and working alongside COSLA and local authority partners. Effective collaboration sits at the heart of this government and the recently agreed Verity House Agreement is testament to our commitment to embrace that collaborative approach to delivering our shared priorities for the people of Scotland. While responsibility for delivery of local authority projects must quite rightly remain with councils as project leads, I have absolutely no hesitation in championing close working with our local authority partners. The remaining 13 recommendations cover a range of areas relating to the governance and delivery of light rail projects. Whilst these recommendations are directed squarely at project leads and local authority officials, there is a link to much of the work being done by this government and its agencies, including Transport Scotland. I am pleased to report that this government and its public bodies, we already operate in line with these recommendations and the best practice suggested as evidenced by our excellent record of delivering major infrastructure projects, including the Borders Railway, the Edinburgh-Glasgow Improvement Programme, the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route and the Queensferry Crossing over the fourth estuary, a complex engineering feat that has put our workmanship workmanship to the front and centre of global engineering. Furthermore, we follow detailed government guidance on procurement, on risk, on optimism bias, all as enshrined as the in the Treasury's Green Book, the Scottish Government's Client Guide to Construction Projects and the Scottish Public Finance Manual. Indeed, the identification and management of risk and adherence to best practice on business case production and the assessment rests at the heart of project and programme delivery within Transport Scotland and the wider government. Transport Scotland always follows published best practice guidance when setting up project governance structures and has its own governance procedures for investment decision making, monitoring and review guidance. Presiding officer, I emphasise that we will continue to very carefully consider each of the recommendations, noting where action has already been taken or has always been best practice, as well as, crucially, where we can go further. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, whilst acknowledging that, that we came into government with a manifest commitment to abandon this project and to spend the £500 million of promised funding on other high-priority infrastructure programmes, once the will of Parliament was made clear, this government endeavoured to ensure our involvement with the project followed good governance practice at all times. It's for that reason that it was essential that we provide clarity around the roles following the vote in favour of the project thereby providing a clear sponsorship structure that allowed us to assume the role of principal funder 
and ensure that public funds were monitored and grant conditions were applied in compliance with published guidance at all times. And whilst I uh, reiterate the point that nine of the ten lead criticisms in the report clearly lie within responsibility of City of Edinburgh Council and with Thai, I acknowledge that lessons must be learned from this report for all parties involved, and I'm clear that we're giving full consideration to recommendations and any actions that follow, ensuring that lessons are learned and best practice always followed for major project infrastructure. Presiding officer, I'd like to finish uh, by once again thanking all of those who took the time to provide evidence to the inquiry and point again to the full cooperation of this government. The provision of evidence that demonstrated a, a comprehensive, transparent and accurate view of events underpinned the approach taken to the inquiry by this government, by ministers and by officials. And I commend that approach to Parliament. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The Cabinet Secretary will now take uh, questions on the issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for that, after which we will need to move on to the next item of business. Uh, members wishing to ask a question who haven't already done so, I'd encourage them to press the request to speak buttons. And I call first Miles Briggs. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of the statement. After almost 10 years and £13 million of taxpayers' money, there's very little in this statement to suggest that SNP ministers have accepted their role in the failures around the Edinburgh Tram project. The former Deputy First Minister John Swinney is mentioned 156 times by name in the report, but not once today by the Cabinet Secretary in her statement. The Cabinet Secretary states that the only cause of failure attributed to the actions of Scottish Ministers was the decision following the debate in Parliament in June 2007 to reposition Transport Scotland as a principal funder as opposed to project partner. Deputy President Officer, that is the understatement of the century. Lord Hardy states, and I quote, the actions of Scottish ministers and the limitations imposed by them on the involvement of officials in 2007 was a serious error and resulted in the failure by the Scottish ministers to protect the public purse. Mm. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, does she now accept that decisions to withdraw Transport Scotland was indeed a serious error? And who in the Scottish Government is taking responsibility for that? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Miles Briggs is absolutely right to point out that the cost of this inquiry and the time that it took to report are not satisfactory. Uh, although I have to say that these are matters over which Scottish ministers have no locus whatsoever, and any interference on our part would have been rightly criticised. Questions of time, questions of cost, these are for Lord Hardy. Um, I would also uh, I would caveat his comments about responsibility by being very clear that I have and the government have considered really carefully all of the recommendations and all of the findings. But I point him again to the fact that one out of ten, the final out of ten, is attributed to Scottish ministers and a minority of recommendations are put to the Scottish government uh, as well. Many of those that actually apply to the Scottish Government were instituted years ago, and Miles Briggs really ought to uh, keep up. But I want to focus on that point about that principle finding of failure to the Scottish Ministers and about the separation of the roles. Um, I narrated in my remarks that this Government came into Government in 2007 not supporting the trams, but we were instructed to proceed by a vote in this Parliament, led, I understand, by an opposition amendment from Labour's Wendy Alexander. When we got that instruction to make the promised funding available, we did so, but that necessitated a separation of roles where Transport Scotland had previously been part of project delivery into being the principal funder. And I just want to quote uh, Mr Heath of Partnerships UK, one of the only independent witnesses that commented on this point in the inquiry. And he said, I think it was very sensible at the time Complex projects require the simplest overall governance structure and reporting to both City of Edinburgh Council and Transport Scotland with inevitably different emphasis in their reporting requirements would have been unnecessarily burdensome and introduced potential decision, delay and risk. Therefore, I do not agree with the finding. Alec Rowley. Presiding officer, I think first and foremost, it's important to acknowledge that now that they have been delivered, the trams are running successfully and the feedback from the people of Edinburgh is largely positive. It is also clear that Edinburgh Council have recognised the errors that were made and have learned lessons from those errors in their successful delivery of phase two of the project. 
I would also have to say that Edinburgh Council have had the good grace to acknowledge their mistakes and apologise, something that this SNP government seems incapable of doing. Even after the report and this statement today, I still pose the question, what lessons has the Scottish Government actually learned? The report was damning of the Scottish Government involvement or indeed non-involvement in the project throughout Transport Scotland's time. So the question remains, is Transport Scotland fit for purpose? And does it have the capacity to provide oversight and support in the large-scale multi-partner infrastructure Cabinet projects Secretary. that Cabinet Scotland Secretary. so desperately Cabinet needs Secretary. moving Cabinet forward? Cabinet Secretary. Mr Rowley, please resume your seat. Cabinet Secretary. Thanks, President Officer. I thank Alex Rowley for the question. I think he is right to reflect the, the um, proper running of the trams that people in Edinburgh now enjoy and the fact that Council did go on to um, produce successful uh, additions to it. And I think that probably underlines the, the fact that Transport Scotland's involvement was not required in those uh, additional sections and probably undermines some of the findings about, um, from, the, from the report about our role at, at the time. Is Transport Scotland fit for purpose? Yes, it absolutely is. My colleague Fiona Hislop and I have the, the pleasure of working with many experts every day who work exceptionally hard to deliver um, the running of our transport system and the development of major projects in Scotland. And I was really proud in my statement to, to reel off a number of the successes that we've had in that regard. The Aberdeen Western uh, Peripheral Route, the Queensferry Crossing, the Borders Railway, among many others. I have absolute faith in Transport Scotland. This ultimately is a historic piece of work. And whilst I will take, uh, I will, we have considered very carefully all the recommendations, so many of them are um, facets of the past and the changes have been instituted years ago. Stuart uh, McMillan to be followed by Graham Simpson. Uh, thank you very much, Seb, saying also. Uh, saying also, the Scottish Government were clear in 2007 about the position uh, on the Edinburgh trams and also the Edinburgh Airport rail link that some in this chamber also wanted to see happen at that time, which have taken even more millions away from the capital budget from other parts of the country. But can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that after the Parliament voted to deliver the tram project, and did the Scottish Government provide the assistance to those tasked to actually deliver the trams? Cabinet Secretary. Um, Presiding Officer, as I have highlighted, the outcome of that vote in Parliament in 2007 was instructed, uh, instructive. We respected it. We transferred accountability of the project to the City of Edinburgh Council, and that necessarily altered Transport Scotland's relationship with the Council uh, going forward. And the decision to, to alter those uh, governance arrangements was to avoid any uncertainty about where leadership of the project lay and to ensure that Scottish Minister's role was strictly as principal funders. Now, I would go on to say that not only did it do that, not only was that reflected in the evidence that, that was the right governance decision, but it also arguably protected the public funds of the Scottish Government for being called upon in future years as the project languished. Graham Simpson to be followed by John Mason. Thank you. John Swinney is named throughout Lord Hardy's report and most of it is criticism. Lord Hardy says this, Mr Swinney said that he would do nothing differently if doing the project again. The conclusion of what I have considered is that that would be an error. Is that a valid finding? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I will open with one of the last remarks I made in, in response to my, my last question, which was that the actions of John Swinney and the decisions that he took following the vote in Parliament, which I have to stress was not supported by the government but by opposition in the parliament today that not only pre created the right governance structure with the separation of roles and, and everything that I pointed to uh, the comments from Mr Heath of Partnerships UK but it also arguably ensured that when John Swinney said 500 million and not a penny more that we were able to stick to that and the funds of the Scottish government were protected. John Mason to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Thank you. This uh, inquiry has taken a ridiculous amount of time and cost a ridiculous amount of money. And it does seem that some lawyers have no sense of urgency and keeping to time. Now, I take the point that the uh, Minister has made, Cabinet Secretary has made, that they have to be independent. But surely, going forward, there is some way of putting a constraint on the length of time and cost of these inquiries. Cabinet Secretary. I do understand the sentiment behind uh, Mr Mason's question. I agree, as I agreed with Miles Briggs, that the length of time this took, the costs that were uh, mounted were not uh, acceptable, frankly. However, I have to stress again that the, the, the time spent 
the, the, the costs incurred, these are not matters over which we have any say whatsoever. It would be wrong for us to do so. Um, having said that, we are providing and we have already been developing guidance on public inquiries, um, not only for the operation of the inquiries themselves, but to support uh, civil servants in, um, in supporting them. And of course, it's worth pointing out that the costs that can uh, arise from public inquiries has to be one of the considerations we make when deciding whether or not to, to convene one. Daniel Johnson to be followed by Willie Coffey. The Cabinet Secretary's answer so far this afternoon has relied upon the fact that Transport Scotland had a, a reduced scope to that of just funder. But Lord Hardy's findings found that it, the Scottish Government provided inadequate oversight of that funding. Indeed, he describes the, 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 the fact that the Scottish Government relied on, and I quote, covert influence with no record or minute keeping. Recommendation 12 outlines key improvements needed for transparency and accountability. So will the government commit to accepting their recommendation in full and review its interactions both with Transport Scotland and delivery partners? Cabinet Secretary. Um, thank Daniel Johnson for the, the question. I've already um, pointed out that all of the recommendations have been considered and will uh, continue to be considered um, by uh, Scottish ministers. And in the particular one that he mentions about record keeping um, and about uh, minuting and document retention, these were instituted years ago. This is capturing a period of time which frankly is uh, very, now very much um, in the past. The Scottish Government, Transport Scotland, Scottish ministers, we uh, committed ourselves to um, supporting this inquiry uh, very fulsomely and in the best of faith and that of course included written statements and oral statements from, from everybody involved. Willie Coffey to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Thanks. The Edinburgh tram inquiry has to lead to good governance in urban infrastructure projects and not to any future hesitation to invest in the public transport networks our cities and our towns need. What assurance can the Cabinet Secretary give that these mass transit projects such as further Edinburgh tram expansion or even the proposed Glasgow Metro will continue to be supported by the Government. Cabinet Secretary. I think it's, um, it, it, it is apt to consider some of the learnings from the Edinburgh Trams project inquiry as we um, embark on uh, the Glasgow Clyde Metro. I've mentioned a number of times that there are recommendations as to uh, light rail projects and the um, engagement between Transport Scotland, between local authorities. We will take all of that on board. I have to say one of the recommendations is about um, uh, Transport Scotland's involvement in the delivery of projects and I have to say that I've made quite clear this afternoon that my view that our decision to separate in 2007 was the right one and I would like to see that continue um, to be uh, instituted. But on the Clyde Metro um, specifically, since the publication of STPR2, we do have a multi-partner group consisting of, of Transport Scotland, SBT, Glasgow City Council, Client Delivery Group, uh, to better define the scale of the work that, that the Metro might represent and the associated governance, etc. around it. And of course, we will take into account the findings of this inquiry as we take that work forward. Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Shopkeepers, business owners and residents in our nation's capital have all been denied answers for far too long by the length of time it has taken for this inquiry to report. This inquiry is not happening in isolation either. There are other similar inquiries which, uh, to which victims, particularly of COVID-19 and Professor Elgemel, will be looking to those inquiries for answers. What what uh, lessons can the Scottish Government learn from the time this has taken and the mistakes that were made in the delivery of this inquiry? Cabinet Secretary. Um, Presiding Officer, I have mentioned and I understand the interest in the point about, about the time and about the costs. And I have noted that it is something, obviously, that the Scottish Government had to consider very carefully when deciding whether or not to start an inquiry. However, once you have decided to institute it, once you have supported it, as in this case, to move to a statute of refuting, you have to understand, as ministers, we can't be involved in dictating the time nor the cost. I do note that one of um, Lord Hardy's recommendations was about only presenting the net costs of public inquiries, less accommodation and less staff. I frankly don't agree with that uh, recommendation. I think full transparency and costs uh, and, and the publication of that is in the public interest. Runa Mackay to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There are serious questions to be asked about the value of the inquiry report's conclusions and whether they're sufficiently supported by the evidence. 
What process will the Scottish Government follow to ensure that it's able to identify the most valuable and evidence-driven recommendations in the report? Cabinet Secretary. Um, the, as, as I've said, Presiding Officer, the report contains uh, 24 recommendations and a minority of these are directed to the Government. Uh, those which are related to the Government, they concern administrative processes, record management, minute-taking uh, and some legislative aspects of setting up inquiries. We have considered all the recommendations, uh, taking into account the length of time that has passed since the inquiry was originally set up and the extent to which a number of these recommendations, as I've said, are already standard practice. Uh, and that relates particularly to those about record management. Uh, the legislative and practical aspects of setting up inquiries um, and those relating to project and, and programme program governments. And I have already said, but I will repeat for uh, the members' um, sake, that we have already worked on guidance both for uh, public inquiries and their interaction with Scottish Government sponsor bodies, but equally for civil servants to help them interact with inquiries. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Sue Webber. Thanks. Uh, in response to the inquiry, the charity Living Streets highlighted the accessibility challenges faced by those walking, wheeling and cycling who then want to integrate their journeys uh, with the tram. Could I ask Cabinet Secretary, are there lessons to be learned about how these particular groups are engaged with and their needs taken into account in the design and procurement processes of future transport projects? Cabinet Secretary. I think there absolutely are. I mean, I would point out, just, just first of all, for the sake of the record, that the, the design and the procurement were matters for the project leads, uh, namely for City of Edinburgh Council and for TIE and not for Scottish Government. But I think as a whole, everybody has lessons to learn in the development of these matters. Uh, I'd like to assure the member that, that suitable provision for, for all users, including pedestrians, cyclists and, and wheelers, is a really important part of uh, Scottish Government infrastructure projects, as is engagement with community and interest groups. We put this at the heart of uh, the development uh, of our projects. Impact assessments uh, prepared at the early stages are evolved throughout the development of the policy and they always require engagement with those affected and we will continue uh, to practice that. Sue Webber to be followed by Jackie Dunbar. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Councillors rely upon the accuracy of reports to enable them to take informed decisions, but it's clear councillors were misled by high-level officials at the Council in Edinburgh. In the Edinburgh Tram Inquiry Report, Lord Hardy blasts Mr Nick Smith of the City of Edinburgh Council's legal department for inaccurate reports to councillors. So can the Minister lay out what action will be taken to hold, sorry, to, can the Cabinet Secretary get it correct, lay out what action will be taken to hold those responsible to account and what reforms will be put in place to stop this happening again? Cabinet Secretary. I think um, Ms Weber is absolutely right to highlight one of the parts of the uh, report which stood out in particular for me and I'm sure that this is something that City of Edinburgh Council and local authorities uh, throughout Scotland will be giving considerable thought to. In terms of what the government can do, there were recommendations within the report uh, made to us about the development of specific uh, sanctions under the civil law of damages and equally a call for a criminal statutory offence. We're given really careful consideration to both of those recommendations. Our view just now is that there may already be provision for such, um, for such developments under the civil law of delictual liability and under the criminal common law of fraud, but we'll continue to consider that. Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Faisal Chowdhury. In the time it has taken for this inquiry to conclude, the previous SNP-led administration at the City of Edinburgh Council approved an extension of the tram lines to, to New Haven, which successfully opened to the public this summer on time and in budget. Edinburgh residents can take some satisfaction that lessons were clearly learnt from the first tram scheme. Does the Edinburgh Trams Inquiry Report provide any further lessons for mass transit in Scotland that have not already been applied in the last nine years? Cabinet Secretary. Um, Jackie Dunbar is, is she's making a really good point. The, the extension of the trams line to New Haven was delivered on time and on budget, and I would add thanks to the strong leadership and the hard work of SNP councillors. But I think it also underlines that point about that principle finding of failure in the, in the inquiry's view about the role of Transport Scotland and the appropriateness of separating those roles. I, I think that it was appropriate to separate the roles and I think that the work to New Haven demonstrates that Transport Scotland's involvement uh, was, was not required. But as I have said to a number of members, there are a suite of recommendations, a minority of which uh, 
apply to the Scottish Government. Many of them have been instituted years ago, but will continue considering the remainder. And Faisal Choudhury. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. This inquiry clearly shows that the Scottish Government walked away from the major capital project. Recommendation 10 within the inquiry reports advised Scottish ministers to consider a working group made up of Transport Scotland and COSLA to best take advantage of the necessary skills and expertise to deliver future projects on time within the budget. So can the Cabinet Secretary advise today if the Scottish Government will implement this recommendation in future large infrastructure projects? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we'll consider that recommendation on a case-by-case -case basis. I think the recommendation itself applies only to light rail, um, and therefore that, that minimises the, the cases that it could apply to, but we'll absolutely uh, consider it. But I, I must again reiterate, it was the, the inquiry heard evidence that the separation of, of the roles from Transport Scotland as going from a, a funder in principle to the principal funder was good governance. And uh, I've already quoted some independent um, witnesses to the inquiry. I would also point to the 2011 Audit Scotland report, which took note of that move and the separation of the roles, but made absolutely no adverse comment about it at the time. Thank you. That concludes questions on the statement. Point of order, Alec Rowley. President officer, you, you, you quite rudely stopped me there as I was trying to finish my question. Can I ask, can, can, can presiding officers reflect on the time given for questions as opposed to the time that we spend debates in here? If we're going to hold the, the government to account, we should be able to put questions and do so without being uh, stopped. Mr and, and Rowley, if you could resume your seat, that's not a point of order. I was not rude. I was exercising the, uh, what was agreed in Bureau in terms of the timings for this statement, which includes an opening question from the uh, main opposition party of one minute and 30 seconds. It, it, it allows for a minute for uh, those from the Labour front bench. Uh, you have been in this parliament sufficiently long, I would have said, Mr Early, to know that. And I think you're coming pretty close to challenging uh, the ruling of the, the chair. With that, there's going to be a brief pause before we move on to the next uh, item of business to allow front benches to change.